Uh, my name is Becky Larson. Um, it's an honor to introduce myself. No, I'm, uh, <laughs> I'm going to talk to you today about some of the work we did for the Dairy Cab. It actually feels very long ago because a lot of the measurement things started at the beginning of the project, so I'll do my best to remember, but usually I only remember things from yesterday. But thankfully, I have Horacio here to clue me in on what I forget. Um, and this work was actually done by a PhD student of mine named Mike Holly. He couldn't be here today. He now works for the USDA ARS as a postdoc. Um, and then quite a few others, everybody. I mean, actually, this was a big, we had other projects going on, and it was really nice to have a nice group of people and try to use similar, um, or exactly, uh, you know, the same methodology, the same instruments. So I'm going to present some stuff here and give you a little bit of the data. A lot of it's published already, so you can go and look at it. Um, and then give you a, f a few of my kind of conclusions I'm trying to draw and how we're looking at integrating some of the things. Uh, so I, I use this slide uh, kind of to show, all right, we have manure systems. I talk to a lot of my uh, extension clientele using this so we can just discuss certain pieces, show them the, you know, the critical parts of integrating different pieces. And I just wanted to point out our research in the, the, the hard like field research stuck to these kind of components, right? We wanted to look at digestion and solid separation um, and liquid storage, slurry storage. Uh, and then the land application piece. Um, I think you know Penn State was kind of doing some of the solid things, and I know they were a little later in getting their research part started, so hopefully we'll be able to combine all of that information into our models as we move forward. I mean, we knew from a lot of other, you know, Horacio had done this really great uh, manure-based LCA when we started uh, before the dairy cap came along, and so we had already known some of the messages, right? Solid liquid separation, we, get a, we can in, implement those kinds of systems and get some reduction. We see digestion, pretty great reductions on forms and manure systems. And then a solid liquid separation on top of the AD, while it might have advantages, uh, otherwise didn't have a huge impact following that. But while we were doing this, you know, we started to say, there's not a lot of data out there. And I, I, you know, I'm a big proponent of you know, sometimes I think my students are like, ah, but I've seen a paper out there in that. Well, we need a lot more data, right? That's why I, I really appreciate that we had the tools to get that data set published, as Matt mentioned earlier, because I really think we're going to need all of these data sets being available for people to really um, look at these systems in more depth. So, I mean, we had some data out there, but there weren't a lot of studies that kind of tracked all of the pieces of information. And being manure people, I don't have to tell you that the variability of the manure characteristics, sometimes the confounding effects you might see, it's really hard to pull out some of the conclusions and be really confident without multiple data sets that the conclusions you're making are correct. So, um, I, I, and this was just another, you know, we knew that not only we have these great benefits from digestion, but we knew that, uh, well, when we digest, we're gonna end up with more ammonia emissions and storage, definitely, and that's, that's a, probably a negative side uh, effect of digestion. So in, in this first study, we wanted to look at going from storage, tracking the same manure, so storage through land application. We were really curious um, as to if we could result in some mitigation steps initially, would those carry through or did we end up losing those emissions later anyway, right? So, you know, our models tell us one thing, but we wanted to really see in some circumstances where we're seeing that sound of stuff. So we did six months of storage um, of manures, and then we went out into the field uh, through a, a season uh, of growing. Uh, we use some FTIR measurements. We use GraceNet protocols for some components, but then uh, used an FTIR to measure uh, most of the emissions. So our treatments, um, we looked at raw manure, Right, so it was stored and then right out into the field. And then we had two treatments. One where we just went through a solid liquid separation system, and then the two components, the solid and liquid, were stored and then land applied. And then in the, in the third set, we went through a digester, then a separator. And so we applied not only the digestate before it was separated, and stored it, but then we also looked at the two components. In Wisconsin, we don't have anybody that's doing digestion without separation on the back end, but it was important for us to kind of characterize what was happening between those steps um, through the process. So the results of this study um, support those initial conclusions that following digestion, so all of these will be the same. I love when everybody uses these 
uh, titles and you're like, what does this mean? But so we had two manure streams. Unfortunately, we wanted to use manure that was being processed at the full scale level. Um, so we had one manure stream, which is that raw one, and then D1 is digested, and then there's the liquids in the solids, and then we've added the liquid and solid impacts together, so you can kind of see. It's really not a fair comparison just to say D1 digested, uh, digestate versus separated liquids, right? You need to add the components together. And then we had a second manure stream um, that went through just the separation process. I really wish we worked hard to try to work with a farm to reconfigure and get the same manure going through just the separator, but that was a bit of a disaster. So we, we, we didn't, we had to use two manure streams, so we'll have two different controls for these. So it limits a little bit of our comparison, but it's, it, it was still pretty useful to do. We also ran into a problem where the digested solids we didn't land apply. Um, so with the FTIR and the time and the changing and how many plots we needed, you could only get through so many without reaching a point passing our protocols where things got messy. So I won't get into the details, but just know that's a limitation um, on this. Um, oh, I should tell you the results, right? Um, so you can see the ammonia emissions from after digestion obviously increased quite a bit because of mineralization. That's something we expected. We did get a, a decrease after we go through separation, right? So in the storage, obviously storage is the main component. Our am ammonia emissions in the study are probably lower uh, than what you'd see, just a little bit based on our methodologies of how we measured it. And the other part is we injected the manure, uh, so we incorporated, it was actually like an immediate incorporation uh, into the soil, so we had really low field impacts um, but we can see that, you know, even with that practice of injection, and, you know, I think a lot of people say, well, you increase ammonia emissions, um, and what we've shown in some of our modeling is that the losses of ammonia, some farmers actually think, I want to increase my ammonia content in my manure as I go through digesters. They all comment to me, that is a great thing, I think I get more yield impacts. Uh, but the reality is when you start to model it and look at it, the losses that, the additional losses you receive end up in a very similar availability out in the field. So we're actually just losing a whole bunch of that. And while there are practices to mitigate that, we're not using those, right? We're not covering uh, storages. It's just, it's not cost effective. And at the times where we see um, that injection is not used based on I want to reduce ammonia emissions. It is at some point, that's why some people integrate injection, but you're choosing injection because your field characteristics will allow you into the field. Or, you know, like Horacio showed, at smaller farms, you know, there is that economic barrier to even getting into that area. And what we see in Wisconsin is once you start digesting and separating other things, if you can do a much lower cost application method, you're going to, right? So if I can irrigate that, I'm going to do that compared to maybe doing some injection and then there goes all those uh, ammonia emissions increasing. Um, not nitrous oxide, I mean it was pretty consistent amongst all those, you obviously major source in the field, we didn't see any differences uh, generally. I think the biggest thing that we saw was some increases in the storage of the solid, particularly after it's been digested. Right, so now we have a, a, the, the nitrogen form, we produced a lot more nitrous oxide. Um, I don't know that, I mean, we expected that, but maybe it wasn't to a bigger degree uh, and had more impact in the overall uh, emissions than we expected. Um, I, you know, this, I just put this up here and all these data, there's so much data, I don't wanna go, I, I'm gonna get lost in it if I try to show it all, but we really, after we, applied the manure and injected it, the treatment showed almost no difference, right? And I think I have a slide, oh, maybe it's in another one. I'm gonna go forward and then come back. Um, as you can see, most of our differences occurred in the storage period, then you hit this red line, and we really didn't see much difference after we got out into the land application part. Um, so it, it really, you know, our future work focused on a lot of the storage components, but the important part was that the impacts we might have changed in mitigating storage, we didn't lose those after we injected in the field, right? It didn't later, oh, I mitigated some nitrogen losses here, now I just increased them later in the system. We didn't really see that. We saw that, uh, you know, through this one year, right, there are some, some things you need to take, you know, if carbon is there, you're probably gonna lose some of that over time, but hopefully you can affect the form of that to, to have less impact. 
So the big thing we always talk about with manure is methane, right, and storage. Obviously, the digestion decreased um, the methane emissions from storage. Uh, and, and further, we saw some decreases uh, in the liquid. Solid liquid separation had a really big impact too. I think, uh, and I'll show you, I think my, I like how I do these all in different orders than I wanted to. Uh, but in the, in the carbon balance, uh, I, I know this is crazy and I highlighted these blue ones down here, but the, the important thing to me was while digestion decreased the, the overall methane emissions, um, the percent that was released as methane afterwards was still pretty high compared to maybe separation, right? We, we saw a really big de decrease after we separated and stored. And I think the key thing that I really, pushing forward, I think we all need to understand is that I know from working with digesters, I'm sure you all do that, people don't run them to be efficient necessarily, right? They're, they're trying to run the uptime of their generators. Most of them size generators probably too small, so they don't really care if the gas production, you know, they're probably maxing out gas production, many of them anyway, or they have a limit to how much electricity they can sell. So their performance of the digester is not always maximized to be that efficient. And so I, you know, I was looking at some data where we studied this particular digester for a while, and its efficiency was a little low in, in terms of its destruction of some of the things. So number one, coming out, it was a little hotter, right? So we're getting more methane emissions initially. And the performance of this digester probably compared to other literature values where we saw reductions bigger than this wasn't quite as good, right? And our separator actually did a really great job. And you know, just as she was mentioning before, particle size is important. I actually think we could achieve really great emissions reductions with separators and series and sequences where we could reduce some of that and I would love more effort to be put into some of those but we really need to track. The other thing we found was that even if we tried to look at different uh, forms of carbon, the ones we were tracking weren't enough for us really to understand where these differences were driving from in some cases. So we actually unfortunately need to even expand some of the parameters we're looking at. Um, but overall, um, again, if you look at, I mean, statistical differences from the raw manure uh, to the digested to the separated, even once combined with all the components together, um, of course, methane and nitrous oxide are the main contributors to that. And there's a nitrogen balance in the paper as well, but I'm probably going to run out of time before even getting to the other studies. Uh, so another study, so after we completed that study, we really wanted to look at some of the uh, manure storage systems, right? So initially we had planned to do some other studies. We're like, well, I'm a manure person. It's easier just to look at storage anyway. So I'm going to stick there for a while. Um, we looked at some additives. Uh, a lot of our producers are actually using additives, um, whether or not they're justified. Uh, I think more than manure is a really common one and proact, and they're using them for different mechanisms, whether that be they want to reduce solids content. That's generally why a lot of them are adding them to their things. But you know, the, the makers of these um, also claim that they could get some reductions in some kind of um, uh, greenhouse gas emissions or that they were using ammonia. And, and under the conditions we studied, we didn't see that. And so I'm only going to show you this one slide, and there's a whole bunch of data, and it's published out there. And um, while I'm not going to knock the, the you know, people selling different products, it's always great to test and try new things, I try to remind the people who are purchasing them to think about the mechanisms behind them that might be leading to that, right? So some of these are supposed to be binding or a polymer or something where you're going to settle. The, uh, I try to remind people the quantity of that that you would need in the terms of a manure storage, I'm sure you're all pretty aware of that, would be so large that the cost would become immediately prohibitive. And generally, you know, if it's a microbial additive or a something else, a lot of times those are already existent. So we just didn't see a lot of impact. We definitely didn't see um, a decrease in methane and we actually saw an increase in some of the products. Um, so, you know, we also want to talk about manure storage covers. I think generally, although we push these, I don't see the, the movement towards them in any, uh, in any way until we can show some better economic return on them. Um, but we wanted to look at some other opportunities with some thermal processing of some like biomass covers that may have some other advantages otherwise later. I don't know that we're getting into that now and I don't even know 
uh, if these will be affected, but we wanted to look at a few things as we're, and I'll tell you about our next steps of why we were doing some of this. Uh, so we did some thermal treatment of wood chips um, and, and some corn cobs and some other things. So we did a steam treated and then we did a biochar, so we converted those. Um, and then we applied them as a cover and then actually mixed them into the manure storage systems and we measured the emissions off of these. And we focused really in this study, we, had, we did some biochar studies already with uh, uh, the greenhouse gases, but we were really focused on ammonia emissions here. So we had these, you can see the different covers. Um, one on the left is the raw wood and that's the wood chips. And then we had the steam treated and then we had the uh, wood biochar and the corn cob biochar that we produced. Um, and in an attempt, we tried to hit a certain temperature in feedstock that would increase ammonia absorption into these particular uh, feedstocks. Um, and what we found was, compared to the control, which is on the left, we had really significant reductions um, in, in uh, ammonia emissions, maybe up to 90%, right? And this is after I said no one's gonna do these things, right? And I'll, so I'll tell you why that we did this in a little bit. But we had really great uh, reductions in these, in these biochars, a, a little less in the steamed and raw wood. Um, and we thought maybe initially, oh, well, maybe actually the biochars did really absorb more ammonia, and so we got better reductions. And, and uh, I'm sorry, the, the, there's a, the cover and the incorporated are, are the differences. So then we looked at, well, let's extract this ammonia, which took us forever because it turns out if you're ever working with biochar, nothing, none of the regular extraction methods work. Um, and what we found was that we did get a lot more absorption uh, of or absorption of these um, of, uh, ammonia compounds onto the biochar than, than the other. So we were like, oh, maybe, maybe this is a thing, maybe we can use this for producing things. But really, uh, when we look at the treatments and the, the total emissions and what we think we mitigated, the amount we absorbed onto that is nothing, right? So really, these are just acting as a physical barrier and again, <coughs> are probably the primary reason we got those kinds of reductions. Oh, sorry. So in the end, you know, digestion is a great thing. We still have a lot of economic issues with that. I'm hoping we'll start to see some changes uh, that that might not be the case, but even in Wisconsin where we have digesters that have paid off their systems, they can't at the moment, we have this big concern with them um, not being able to operate anymore because their new contract rates are going to be lower than the maintenance of the generators themselves. Uh, so while it's a great thing, I really think separation is probably a great area that we may be able to get some movement uh, in increasing the people who are separating and doing a little more work into, you know, more efficient separation and how that can impact emissions. Um, the other thing I wanted to mention is um, the, the, that we're using a lot of this data to now do like an optimization model at a larger scale. So the, part of the reason we were interested in doing this is that manure processing for me has been very complicated. People want you to evaluate all of these technologies and they're popping out all the time of separation technologies and to me that's been really difficult in my own state to respond to my clientele about what are the right options and what we're doing. So I have this very, very smart guy that's at UW who does optimization models and we've recently received a grant to be able to incorporate a lot of technologies into an optimization model to look at what scales and you know could we do low level processing and then increase to a scale to do more significant processing and then maybe uh, grab onto some economic advantages in some of those areas um, that we might be able to implement some of these technologies. So while I want to share with you that we're doing that, I also would love to integrate a lot of the work I've seen here today, like uh, at the conference and the things that you've been doing. So I might reach out to some of you at some point. I hope you'd be willing to share your data because I really think that if we can start to evaluate that not only the environmental, but the economics and look at kind of these like optimization models that they use for transportation and airlines that we might be able to identify strategies that might be most economically successful. And we know that's a big reason of why we may or may not see things being implemented. And I know in Wisconsin, it's not even necessary that something might be most the most cost advantageous. It might be that it's the least you know, burden, right? So even some of my counties and other things are willing to pay for some of that. 
Um, and of course, we're still integrating a lot of this into the modeling that Arasio talked about. So now that we have all this data, <laughs> it's a never ending scenario running. So, but he has a lot of great papers out there already that look at some of the things people were asking. Okay, again, USDA has been great in funding all of this work, um, and I have, I'd be happy to ask any questions. It was a lovely day in the field. I used to ride the bus. I do not ride the bus anymore. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, you, there's a wide range of uh, separation performance mm -hmm. in the field. So what, when you present this information, what are you assuming in terms of recovery and stuff? Uh, I'd have to look back at the numbers of what our efficiency was. Um, I, I can't remember this particular one, um, but we calculate, we determine that efficiency. And I don't, most of the, like, the, the screw presses that we saw out in the field, their range of operation wasn't quite as variable as some of the other technologies, but I, I sorry, I can't remember off the top of my head where we fell into that. I was wondering if a biochar cover would really be economical or any cheaper than in previous covers. No, probably more expensive because you can't get it. <laughs> but we, we, the reason we are kind of looking at some of it is because the new thing, I, I don't really think biochar has a, is going to be something that we apply in the fields or do other things. I do think that there's the potential um, that you could possibly make some fertilizers out of it. And what we're looking at in Wisconsin is that the idea that we need to extract so much phosphorus in so many high animal dense areas and we just, all of the technologies that people keep pushing, they're just, they're not economically successful. So we see one go in and then it disappears and you know, I just get constantly the same questions. So we're kind of thinking maybe if we thermally treat some of the manure solids at a digester, we have all this waste heat, which has generally been the issue with going from manure solids to biochar, could we make the phosphorus of much more dense, right? And then maybe we lose a lot of nitrogen, so could we impregnate some of the nitrogen uh, maybe from, from manure into that and maybe move it from there? So we're, we've been looking at all these applications of biochar in small areas and then trying to do some laboratory things to tweak them to see if we can understand the mechanisms and then improve some of their uh, capabilities in the terms that maybe then we could move the nutrients a little farther, more cost effectively, and produce the biochar at a lower cost than what we're seeing at some of the other things. I don't know if any of that, that's why I, I'm gonna just, uh, I like saying, okay, optimization guy, we're gonna give you all this data and you're gonna tell us, because I can't, it's too much data to try to sort through to see if there's enough connections you can make with different pieces that might be successful. Oh, oh more. Which year or month of, uh, I mean, which month or season of the year did you do the uh, land application? Uh, so we did, we did land application in the spring uh, and then measured throughout the season through to the fall. So it's not comparable to long-term studies, but we were really just trying to see if our treatment differences had major impacts from one conversion to the other. And, yeah. and if, if the story's time is longer, do you see that the land, the emission from land, land application would decrease more? Uh, I mean, if you're storing and storing, you know, you might be losing nitrogen and carbon, so there's less than after you apply, so likely you might impact that decrease overall. I don't, I don't know. It, it might be similar. I'd have to look at some of the model data. And the six month storage is based on? I mean, that's typical, we, right? So, I mean, we generally design, I mean, as, as a permanent facility, you need to do six months of storage. It ended up being that way because we had a late field go in, so it might end up being five months for the study. It just ended up being six. So I was try we were trying to be realistic. Uh, generally, we have four months of winter, so people are storing through that period. But if you're permitted, you have to have the six months anyway, so. Yeah. With the biochar, you had the better, I mean, it's not absorbing, so it's a better cover. Why is it just it's lighter and then we stay? Yeah, it's, it, it seemed it. to be like the, I forgot the conclusion, the, that it was able to maintain at the surface. Even the incorporated ones that we mixed for a while were, were able to 
to rise to the surface and stay a, as a pretty even cover with less porosity. And I think the, the others get saturated after a bit, so the amount of um, char that was not saturated in the manure was less than the others. And they did start to degrade at some point, not as much as you would see with straw or something, but definitely saw some degradation. That, following up on that mm. question, when, when it does start to degrade, did you actually see bigger openings show up in the biochar? Not necessarily, not straw like. Straw covers break up and you start yeah. No, not over six months. So that was one of the other things is we're thinking, could you, one of our original ideas was so covers, doing them, and this is why I forgot about this too, uh, doing covers that degrade and then adding them every year probably isn't feasible, but could you put a biochar cover in some way suspend it over the storage and so that, well, it's out there, uh, you're, you're, keep it there for a few years, you could disturb it, you know, move some away for your agitation, emptying, whatever. Or if you're digested and separated and you don't have, need to do a lot of agitation, maybe you could use that in that circumstance. And then after a few years, you know, remove that and actually sell it or use it as some kind of potential fertilizer. So we're trying to think of these different ideas of how you might integrate it and none of them may ever make financial sense, but we'll, we'll find out hopefully eventually. <laughs>